Hello, my name is Dave Wood and I'm the founder of Type Focus, a company devoted to the career success of your students. The focus for this session is on the transitions your students go through and how you can help them. I'll present ideas via this video and you'll get a chance to discuss them in small groups. Your moderator will facilitate the large group discussions and keep us all on track. 5x5 five five, number 1. A 5x5 five five is a group of 5 discussing for 5 minutes. Break into 5x5s five five now. Move around and get to know someone new. Introduce yourself, name, what you do, and one thing you're proud of in your co-op program. Moderator will pause the video for 8 minutes, 3 minutes to regroup, and 5 minutes to discuss. 5x5 five five, number 2. What role does your co-op program play in the success of your students? What role do you play in the success of your students? Does anyone take responsibility for student success? Pause the video for 10 minutes, 5 minutes for the 5x5, five five, and 5 minutes for group sharing. There isn't much point to having a great co-op program if your student drops out before the program is over. Close to 50% of students in two-year college programs drop out. And this number is rising as the economic meltdown forces less qualified students back to school to prepare for employment. The biggest dropout rate is always first year. I think because the first year presents the biggest changes and challenges to the student. It is the time of greatest transition. The cost of dropping out can be quite high. First to your institution. The conservative dropout rate would be 30%. If the average tuition in Canada is about $5,000, therefore if you have 1,000 students and 300 drop out, your institution is losing $1.5 million every year. What would a realistic improvement goal be? Reducing the dropout rate from 30% to 25%? That alone would account for another quarter of a million dollars into the cash flow. Other institutional costs include the loss of reputation to your program, the loss of alumni support, loss of ancillary student fees for the bookstore purchases, cafeteria usage. Besides the lost revenue, it is illuminating to see how much institutions pay to recruit a new student. The average cost is now $2,500 per student. These costs represent office staff, career fairs, travel, telephone, conference representation, and marketing materials. Cost to your students is another matter and includes the loss of self-esteem. Opportunity cost to earn money and get experience. Incurred student debt, up to $20,000 a year. So if a student drops out at the near end of a two-year program, they've missed out on $60,000 worth of earnings potential and they've incurred a $40,000 debt. In summary, it costs $2,500 to get a student in the doors. It costs $5,000 a year to lose a student. It costs students $50,000 a year when they drop out. And the point of all this? From a holistic point of view, and what I mean by that is looking beyond the stovepipe view of any one office, resources put into increasing retention should be well received by administration. Seeking additional funding for innovative ways of implementing the ideas we will talk about today may be a good idea. Why do students drop out? Look at this table. Recent data in 2012 for Ontario. 8% didn't have enough money to continue. Close to 7% wanted to leave for work. 6% their marks were too low to keep on going. 10% wanted to change schools or programs. 20% left for health or personal or other reasons. But look at this reason. Don't like it, not for me. Almost half the students leaving cite this as the main reason. Presumably they have enough money, don't want to leave for work, are getting okay grades, are not attracted to another program, and don't have a health or personal reason for leaving. So what does this phrase mean? Don't like it, not for me? Under what conditions would one not like a program? It's not likely the program that is disliked, but the whole secondary experience. I think that this phrase is probably code for being scared, confused, and uncertain. All normal expectations for anyone in the neutral zone. The neutral zone is a transitions concept. Let's turn to that model now. The vertical bar measures coping effectiveness. Many of you have seen the Tom Hanks movie, Sleepless in Seattle. He had a great marriage, 
lost his wife to illness, became somewhat depressed and therefore sleepless, so his young son was worried. The L represents the change. In this case, it is the death of his wife. This results in a drop in effectiveness. He's become depressed. Bridges calls this the ending zone. All change brings about an end to something. The next period of time is a prolonged period of reduced effectiveness. He calls this the neutral zone. It is between the endings that the change is brought and the beginnings that can be started when the endings have been worked through. It is a time of finding out who am I post-change. Tom knew who he was as a husband. He's not so sure who he is as a single man. He has to figure this out before he can move on to new beginning. Depending on how one answers the question in the neutral zone, the beginnings may not be positive. Tom may decide that life is not worth living. He may decide that life will never be quite as good and resign himself to loneliness. He may get over it and return to his previous level of effectiveness. He could learn some important lessons and become even more effective. What I'm hoping is that you can help your co-op students to reach this higher plane. Bridges uses the metaphor of the Israelites leaving Egypt as a way to put this model into focus. They were slaves in Egypt for many generations. They didn't like it, but they knew who they were and it was stable. The change was leaving and crossing the Red Sea. Their endings included being afraid they wouldn't have enough to eat. The neutral zone was the desert where they wandered for two full generations. They were finding out, who are we? Their mindset changed from slaves to tough nomadic warriors. Now they could face the trials of conquering the Promised Land, something they never could have done if they'd gone straight from the Red Sea to the Promised Land. They were figuring out, who are we? post-change. But the neutral zone is a scary place and many wanted to actually go back to Egypt. Bridges calls this fleeing the neutral zone. And in the co-op setting, it is dropping out, going back to the comfort of the pre-change world. Unfortunately, it will likely result in a loss of self-esteem. I tried and failed. So there's a long-term loss. Let's look at how the concept of endings might be applied to your students. The pre-change stability is their pre-co-op program life, their student life. They're probably feeling quite stable in it. The change is entering a co-op program. The change brings about endings. What changes when a person enters one of your co-op programs? For example, expectations change. The student is no longer just a student, but a professional who is expected to contribute. What ends with those changings? Loss of the familiar. Students know what is expected of them as students. Papers, research, library skills, etc. Now they are in a new situation with a new boss, new co-workers, new and unfamiliar standards, etc. Pause the video for five minutes to discuss the changes and endings your co-op students experience. Students who experience the loss will grieve and go into the neutral zone. The neutral zone is a very tough place to be. It is also the heart of the transition process. How do we help students? Bridges suggests that changing the metaphor is a good way to help students rethink their options about the neutral zone. 5x5 five five, number 4. A metaphor captures the feelings of a student in the neutral zone. When you ask, how does this feel? If they are overwhelmed, they might answer, like I'm lost in the woods. Think back to your own experience in your first professional role. What was your metaphor like? Share your metaphor with your group for five minutes. Pause the video now. If your metaphor was negative, how could you change it to be more optimistic? For example, what would have to be changed so the feeling of being lost in the woods becomes more of an exciting adventure? Talk about what changes to your own metaphor would have made it more optimistic. For example, lost in the woods becomes an adventure if you are prepared for it. What changes to your metaphor would be needed to make it more positive? 5x5 five five, number 5. Discuss in your 5x5 five five how these changes could have been translated into an action plan for your success. Example of being lost in the woods. You need a compass and a map. That might be a study plan. You need bush survival skills. Those might be library skills. You need a friend to share the experience. Could be your co-op advisor. But pause the video for 10 minutes, 5 minutes for the 5x5, five five, and 5 minutes for the moderator to canvas the large group for some examples.
The previous discussion is a useful model to follow when talking to your students because it fits their experience and leads to a discussion of a reasonable actions that can form a plan. You'll find this an engaging workshop exercise if you are talking to a group of students, say after their first co-op experience. Focus on the changes needed to become more positive and proactive. Remember this table? I said it was likely a reflection of the discomfort being felt in the neutral zone. Don't like it? Not for me? Maybe excuses to quit and flee the neutral zone, rather than tough it out to discover who they are, to grow past their comfort zone. If the student doesn't drop out, then they have answered the question, who am I? Some students who don't have support will come to sad conclusions about themselves and their post-secondary experience will be limiting for them. What we really want for them is for your students not just to survive, but to thrive. We started this session by thinking about your students' success. Would you agree that helping your students to navigate the neutral zone is within the scope of your role? I'm hoping you would. In summary, at this point we can see that the transition model predicts that students will be in the neutral zone and stressed out trying to answer the question, who am I really? Answering the question, who am I really, is really about self-awareness and one of the best tools for understanding yourself is the personality indicator. Examples of personality assessments include the MBTI and the type focus type indicator. They all create the familiar four-letter code. For example, I'm an ENFP. In order to put value on the personality type into perspective, we will do a couple of simple exercises. Start by signing your name on your handout, just as if you were signing a check. Now, sign your name again just underneath that signature, but now use your other hand. What are some words you would use to describe your second signature? Most people come up with messy, childish, awkward, awful. And how would you feel at the end of the day if you had to use only your non-preferred hand? Most would say tired, exhausted, frustrated, drained, worn out. Have you ever been in a job that just didn't work for you? You may blame the job or yourself. Chances are it wasn't the job or you. It was the lack of fit between what the job needed and what your personality type brought to it. When you were born, your brain was hardwired for certain preferences, just like the preference to use one hand over the other. As you grew up, you became either right or left-handed. You developed your personality in a similar way. When you find work that fits your personality, it will feel natural. If you work against your personality, it will be like a right-handed person having to use their left hand all day. You can do it, but it will be draining. Students who understand how they fit with the demands of the job or the personality of their boss will be much more successful. Let's take a closer look at personality type. Are you an extrovert or an introvert? These are terms used to describe how you prefer to interact with the world. Extroverts focus their energy outwards and tend to be more talkative and outgoing in their dealings with others. Introverts are more reflective and tend to take more time before speaking up. 5 by 5 number 6. From an extroverted or introverted perspective, what would be your idea of an ideal co-op work environment for an extrovert? And also, same question for an introvert. And secondly, what would be your idea of the ideal leadership style of your co-op work manager for an extrovert and for an introvert? Pause the video for 10 minutes, 5 by 5, plus 5 minutes to debrief. We're breaking into our coffee break now, so you can take 15 minutes, and when you come back, please regroup into new groups of five. The facilitator will call you at the end of the time, and we can start again. So pause now for the break. Welcome back. I trust you're in a new group and have said hello to everyone. What's the difference between a judging type and a perceiving type? Judging and perceiving are two ways of describing how you like to deal with the world. Judging types, by the way, judging here does not mean being judgmental or condemning, it means making a judgment or a decision. They like to organize their world and feel most comfortable when they have a plan and things are worked out. Perceiving types like to be open to new opportunities and therefore are seen to be more spontaneous and flexible. A judging type who planned a trip would likely want to have a daily itinerary. This may, this way, 
they feel they are getting the most of it. On the other hand, a perceiving type would find that restrictive. For them, the joy of a trip is stumbling across the unexpected and being free to explore new things as they come up. It's not a matter of being right or wrong. They are different in complementary ways of doing things. 5x5, five five, number 7. From a judging or perceiving perspective, what would be your idea of an ideal co-op work environment for a judging type and for a perceiving type? What would be your idea of the ideal leadership style of your co-op work manager for a judging type and for a perceiving type? Pause the video for 10 minutes, 5 minutes for the 5x5 five five and 5 minutes for the moderator to debrief. Here's a general question for everyone. Do you think an extroverted perceiving, that is an outgoing and spontaneous co-op student, might have a personality clash with an introverted judging, that would be a quiet and organized workplace manager? What would the student do that would get on the manager's nerves? What would the manager do that would puzzle and frustrate the student? Pause the video for five minutes. Five minutes for the moderator to survey the whole group. How can you help your students? In personality type practice, there is a concept of reframing and type flexing. Reframing means to see someone in their complementary strength rather than the absence of your own strength. Type flex means to respond to that person in their preferred manner. In the end, you want to promote the constructive use of differences. This could be one of the great learning experiences for any co-op student, learning how to get along with real co-workers in the real world who are fundamentally different from them. To understand the concept of reframing, let's understand how perception works. In this example, the person is a perceiving type, so they see the whole world through a perceiving filter. What gets through the filter are statements that match their perceiving strengths, in this case, flexibility. What is hard to perceive are statements from a judging type. In this case, the strength is a focus on being organized. So in this case, the statement, we have to meet the deadline, and we need to plan our team's work more thoroughly, are not perceived positively. Now, why is that? It's because the, the perceiving type does not hear a spontaneous or flexible approach. What they're hoping to hear is something like, we need to adjust our deadlines to the circumstances, or we need to be open to different ways to get our work done. If you do not see your strength in another person, you think of them as having the negative of your strength. For example, a preference for perceiving views a judging type as being inflexible. Preference for judging views a perceiving type as being disorganized. A thinker views a feeler as being illogical. The feeler views the thinker as being unfeeling. A reframing example, a J is usually more organized than a P. However, for a J to characterize the P as being disorganized is a negative valuation and doesn't take into consideration their flexibility. A P is usually more flexible than a J. However, for the P to characterize the J as being inflexible would be a negative view and loses sight of their organizing strengths. In a type flex example, a J can type flex to a P by building in even more rather than less project milestones. This helps the P keep on track, and if the P's spontaneity starts to get him off track, he can be brought back quickly. A P can type flex to a J by asking the J to create project milestones so they are clear and discussing any changes to them before making them. 5x5 five five, number 8. In our previous discussion, the focus was on an extroverted perceiving student having a personality clash with an introverted judging manager. An important co-op learning experience for this student would be to learn how to reframe and type flex to different personalities. How would you encourage the student to reframe and type flex to this manager? Pause the video for 10 minutes. Five minutes for the five by five and five minutes for the moderator to debrief. Shifting gears here towards something called success factors. Moving away from the concepts of Bridges transitions or Young's personality types, I'm going to introduce another piece of the puzzle, and that are the psychosocial factors relating to student retention. The following data on 10 psychosocial factors comes from 20,000 university students using the Type Focus program. These are the 10 psychosocial factors linked to retention. They make sense. For example, if someone has good time management skills, 
they are more likely to succeed in their education because they will complete their assignments on time. In this graph, the horizontal axis is high school grades and the vertical axis is the percent of students assessing themselves on their time management skills. Many more A students assess themselves at the higher end of the scale. About twice as many A students rank themselves much above average than much below average. B students are about even on their rankings. Lower grade students start to go the other way. Many more begin to rank themselves as much below average, about twice as many, a reversal from the A students. Since high school grades predict very well for college success, even better than SAT scores, this is a significant finding. And it shouldn't come as a big surprise that judging types, who are the more organized types, tend to score higher on time management than their perceiving counterparts. There are about four times as many J's in the higher time management rankings, and just the opposite is true at the lower levels of time management ranking. Most are perceiving types. A competitive attitude is another psychosocial factor indicator of grade point average. In this case, most of the A students rank themselves very high in the competitive attitude. The higher B grades are flat on this measure, and the lower B grades and C grades swing the other way. More of them show a lack of competitiveness. And as you might expect, the judging types are more competitive than the perceiving types. Judging types predominate in the higher levels of competitiveness and tend to reverse in the lower ends of the scale. So far, we've looked at three concepts. Transitions, personality types, psychosocial factors related to retention. Now we'll start to bring them together. Data comes from 78 first-time, full-time students from a large state university with GPA and retention status available. Started in 2007. By 2008, 18 had dropped out. 60 were still enrolled. This is a 23% dropout. Type focus data was captured at the beginning of the 2007 school term. The chi-square results comparing enrolled versus not enrolled after one year all were in the expected direction. Chi-square is a statistic telling you how certain you can be that the results are not random. The smaller the number, the greater confidence you have in the results. In this case, the two variables that stand out are social support and external commitments. All these variables have an effect, but these two are most trustworthy in their ability to predict whether a student will remain in the program after one year. The validity of my last statement is backed up by this graph where the high to very high level of social support had much higher percentages of enrolled students after a year, and conversely, look how high the percentage of dropouts occur in the low and very low levels of social support. Students who scored low on social integration, they would answer strongly disagree or disagree to the question, I've made good friends on campus, are an interesting group. 19 of the 78 scored in the low to very low category. And as you can see, 10 were introverts, and 9 were extroverts. However, you can see that 10 of the introverts persisted, but only 5 of the 9 extroverts did. This is a highly significant result as measured by the chi-square statistic. In this case, all 10 students with very low to low scores on social integration who were introverts persisted. Only 5 of the 9 extroverts did. Low integration is a much more serious for extroverts than for introverts. This shows how much more insight you can gain into the data by combining personality type information into it as well. It might be important to keep this in mind as you debrief your co-op students after co-op term. Extroverts will value and need social interaction more so than introverts. A pre-co-op discussion about an introverted versus extroverted job environment may help students understand themselves better and be better prepared if their preferences are not a good match. This screen is looking at all 10 factors added together. If we combine all 10 psychosocial factors and look at the top one-third of the scores, we can see that the enrolled students were represented twice as often as the dropouts. Conversely, in the bottom one-third of the scores, almost twice as many dropped out. If we combine just some of the stronger variables, in this case general health, social support and external commitments, the predictability gets better. Now it is 0.06. You can see the predominance of enrolled, which are the green bars at the higher end of the scores, an obvious shift to dropouts, the red bars at the other end. In this table, showing results for external time commitments, 
The heavy and very heavy groups had a 33% dropout rate compared to the 5% rate for the enrolled. Heavy time commitments beyond one's course load is a killer. I've created a failure to thrive model in a 2 by 2 matrix. If we look at students who have poor skills, but they are supported, they will likely struggle with transition. They may need basic training, they may need to drop courses, they may need to attend summer school, they may need to change their major or transfer to a different course, they may need to be a stopout. So they may struggle a bit, but chances are they will improve and learn more about themselves and in effect grow from the experience. Students who have good skills and high aptitude and are supported will likely succeed with transition. Most will persist. A few may have learned what they need to learn and drop out, but they're all functioning at a higher level. The students who have poor skills and are not supported, I think of as lost souls. Dramatic failure rate, low GPA in the first term, 55% of the fall OA dropouts had a GPA less than 1.3 at the end of fall 07. And the students who have good aptitude but are not supported will struggle with transition, likely have a lower than expected GPA. They'll be fragile, at risk for negative events, such as a breakup of a girlfriend or boyfriend may put them off the edge and they'll leave the program. They have unexpected, based on their high aptitude, failure to thrive. This is our familiar table based on the 2012 data from Ontario. How does it relate to the type focus failure to thrive model? Well, it doesn't appear as if the dropout rate is due to poor academic preparation. It looks more like it is a difficult neutral zone. Along with personality type factors like a personality clash with the co-op managers and the psychosocial factors, most likely social support, especially within close-lit cultural groups. To close out this session, I've been given permission to display some real data. In this case, from the Georgian College students who enrolled between January and March of 2012. This graph shows the students' ratings for the question, I'm satisfied with my choice of major or program. You can see that 30 were neutral, 5 disagreed, and 1 strongly disagreed. 36 students would probably benefit from a discussion about what's going on, and do they need to shift to a different program. How motivated are they to continue? This graph shows the students' ratings for I have clearly identified my career goal. Here we see 77 students who are unsure, 10 who are saying, I don't have a clue. If you were working hard, struggling through the neutral zone, how motivated would you be to continue if you really didn't know all your effort is going into the right direction? This is one student's answer to the question on social support. In answer to the question, my friends all agree that getting a good education is important, they disagree. In answer to the question, my family is proud of me for getting an education, they disagree. And the last question, my family understands and is sympathetic to the amount of work my studies take, they strongly disagree. The chances for this student are slim. Do you have a role to play here? This student's score rating for external commitments is very low, meaning a poor rating, because that means they have very high external commitment load at least 30 hours a week for family responsibility, 30 more hours a week on employment, and another 10 hours a week on other commitments. That's 70 hours a week above and beyond their official course load. This student's chances are slim. Do you have a role to play here? The last 5x5. Five five. What can be done to make the transitions more successful for your co-op students? Before their first experience, during their co-op experience, and after the co-op experience? Could you incorporate the concepts of transitions, personality type, and psychosocial factors into it? Pause the video for 10 minutes. Five minutes for the 5x5 five five and five minutes for the moderator to debrief. In summary, a few ideas about best practices. What can be done to support your students who are in transition? Early warning systems of some sort, high school marks are a good indicator of college success, as well as the type focus success factors. Proactive advising, counseling, and mentoring. Accurate choice of majors help students' success and retention. Integrated support programs. Career and co-op offices with student affairs and counseling. In summary, take heart. It's a complex but doable. 
can't do everything at once, but you can do something at once. Start small and prove as you go. Collaborate with other departments with different budget lines. And finally, thank you. I hope this video session has been worth your time. My name is Dave Wood.